Turn over. All right, so good evening, everyone. My name is Dwayne Urban, and I am the uh, creator and one of the admins of Maryland Gun Owners, uh, the group on Facebook, as well as the owner of Urban Defense LLC. Uh, I'll be the host and the moderator for tonight's event. I appreciate everyone's indulgence in kind of getting everything set up. I know we're getting started, I think, a little later uh, than some of you thought, but I appreciate that. Along with me tonight is attorney Andrew Saller from Saller, Lord, Ernstberger, and Inslee, as well as Andre McDonald from the McDonald Law Firm. Uh, guys, why don't you give a little bit about yourselves and your firms? Good evening. As Dwayne said, I'm a partner at Saller, Lord, Ernstberger, and Inslee. I routinely appear in the district and circuit courts. Guns, drugs, shootings, murders, rapes, robberies, all the fun stuff all over the state. Um, I'm a lifetime member of the NRA, I'm an executive member of Maryland Shall Issue, and I'm in court probably five days a week. Good evening, Dwayne. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for coming out. I know it's, been, it's a rainy night. As Dwayne said, I'm Andre McDonald. I'm the principal attorney at McDonald Law Firm. My firm is not as exciting as Andrew's. My primarily practice in the area of estate law. So I come into a lot of firearms issue when we have an estate and there's firearms involved. So what happens to those firearms? And I'm also a friend of the Second Amendment. Okay. Well, thank you both for being here tonight. Um, also, we are joined by Chris Pruitt and representatives of the USCCA. So Chris, why don't you come on up and take this mic and uh, tell us a little bit about this uh, USCCA, what, what you have to offer and, and why it's important. Appreciate it. I don't get as fancy of a microphone. <laughs> we'll get you one next time. Second class citizen here. <laughs> um, so a little bit about the USCCA, what it really is, what the purpose of the organization is, is you guys have phenomenal attorney up here, right? And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not rich and I probably couldn't afford them. And I want to be able to pay for that. So one of the components of the USCCA is an insurance benefit that's focused on being able to make sure that you have access to, there's no limit to defense expenses, both civil and criminal court, which allows you to pay for those attorneys, expert witness, private investigators, stuff of that nature. There's $100,000 specifically available for bail. So if bail set a million, 10% is gonna be that 100,000, that's where that's applicable. And then there's also $2 million available annually for damages if they're awarded in civil court. You could be completely justified and even if you're justified, they turn and they sue you. If they win or you hit a settlement agreement, you can actually have that paid on your behalf, included as part of the membership. Now, the other major component we were just talking about is the training aspect, right? How many people in this room already have their wear and carry? <laughs> awesome. I was thinking maybe there'd be a few people here that were questioning whether they were going to get their wear and carry, and that's why they wanted to come learn first. But... <laughs> So oftentimes what happens with people when we get our wear and carry permit or whether we get a concealed carry permit, we do that training and then we stop right there, right? We do the minimum what the state requires us to do and we then sit there and try to call ourselves responsible gun owners, right? Well, is it really responsible to just do the minimum, right? So we have to go above and beyond. The training that the USCCA provides allows you to actually log in online the same way we'd log on to Netflix, go train in a comfortable atmosphere. All of our trainings are five to 30 minute episodes so that you don't have to worry about like extremely long commitments of time, right? All of us can fit five minutes into the calendar. You can go through that training and it's all documented evidence that can be used in court on your behalf, right? The more training that you have is going to help you make the correct decision and the more black and white that you can make it, the easier his job is. And the more documentation you have to justify your actions also makes his job easier, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but like, one, I want an attorney good enough that I don't even hit court in the first place, right? But number two, I gotta do my due diligence in being prepared enough to make sure that that actually happens, right? So I always equate the USCCA membership to roughly a tank of gas, right? We all go to a gas station, we spend, you know, 50, 60, 70 bucks on a tank of gas, and we don't think anything of it because it's just unfortunately part of our life, right? The top member level USCCA offers is $49, so less than a tank of gas a month, but that gives you access to all of the trainings, insurance benefit, all of those different things. The other two member levels are 29 a month, 39 a month, respectively. The difference between the membership levels is how much training that you get access to. Um, 
when we look at the insurance benefit, it's going to remain the exact same. Now, the reason I do preface that is because you have freedoms to choose whatever member level you so choose. You also have freedoms to switch member levels, whatever you see fit based off of the amount of time available to you. So I always highly recommend going with that top member level that gives you that more training, get that training done, and then you know make your decisions on how you may want to proceed with your membership after that point. But you want to have that training done because does anybody here want less training if they're put into a self-defense incident? See, I knew you guys could all raise your hands though, right? <laughs> We want to make sure that you're educated enough to avoid situations, to be able to save your life, God forbid, and also to make sure that you can come home to your family, right? That's what's really important about all of this, and we want to give access to all of those pieces. How many people are members here tonight? A lot. <laughs> Man. I'm going to talk to our marketing team because I think they sent the email to the wrong list. <laughs> oh, man. That's awesome. Yep. So we do... So we do keep access, like we do keep it an active record of when you do complete them, but you do have the ability to still go back and watch them multiple times so that you can go through that process again. Um, so that does make it pretty simple in that aspect as well. Um, I, I don't know exactly how long we keep them for, but I'm assuming that we keep them in our database for at least 10 years. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure. And don't worry, like if you guys have questions, stuff of that nature, we're still going to be here available to, you know, help you guys out, answer those questions. And for those of you who are not members yet, obviously help you guys be part of our organization and welcome you guys with open arms as well. With that being said, um, I'm going to turn the mic back over to these guys and we're going to have a nice informational session where we're going to learn a lot about some of these new laws that I may not be fond of. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to the USCCA for your assistance in setting this event up. So tonight's event, uh, we're going to begin with a discussion on some of the significant changes to Maryland law, which will take place October the 1st. Uh, following this, there will be a discussion on some of the legal challenges, both in Maryland and outside of Maryland, um, and what the outlook of those challenges are, how long this could take, what, what our expectation, our reasonable expectation should be. Uh, after these discussion points, there will be a question and answer period, which I'll announce. So in order to make sure we get all the information out, we just ask that you hold your questions until that time for that question and answer period. Following that, we will end the formal portion of this event, and you'll have the opportunity to meet with me, our guest speakers, and uh, our vendors in the back room tonight. We're, we're joined by uh, USCCA, Tri-Spear Training Group, uh, My Fingerprint Guy, um, and of course, um, uh, Saller, Lord uh, Ernstberger, and Inslee. You got it. All right. I always get that wrong. Got it right this time. All right. So please check them out and see what they have to offer. Additionally, uh, my company, Urban Defense, has a table in the back and we'll be available to discuss our firearms training program as well as some of our new training uh, that we've just released that we're really excited about and I think you'll be excited about as well. Uh, and also there'll be a chance to win a free seat in one of our upcoming trainings. I'll talk more about that at the end though. We don't need to get into that right now. Some housekeeping, the restrooms are in the back corner over there. They are conspicuously marked. Uh, we just ask that you keep the room and the restrooms clean. Uh, kindly, we ask that if you have any trash, you deposit it into one of the trash cans that's around here and, and help us to keep this, uh, this venue clean and return it better than what we found it. So let me go ahead and start this discussion with a disclaimer and then a statement. So first, the disclaimer. All statements made during this event are intended for educational purposes only and are not intended to convey legal advice or create an attorney-client relationship. The host and the speakers highly recommend that attendees seek the assistance of legal counsel regarding any questions you may have regarding firearms laws in the state of Maryland. So by talking to one of these two gentlemen today, they, you do not have them on retainer. That is not necessarily creating a legal uh, and binding uh, 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 relationship between the two of you. Now, a statement. Nobody on this stage serves in the Maryland General Assembly. Okay, and nobody on this stage had anything to do with the laws that were passed that most of us don't like. Okay, so please don't kill the messenger. 
All right, so um, we're going to do the best we can to, to give you good information and, and help you understand what's going on, but we had nothing to do with those laws. So with that said, let's go ahead and let's get into it. Andrew, why don't you go ahead and give us a rundown of Senate Bill 1, and then we can kind of discuss the intricacies, implications, and so forth. I'm guessing almost all of you are here for Senate Bill 1. This past year, the legislature made a determined priority, both Luke Clippinger, the chairman of Judiciary Proceedings in the House, as well as uh, State Senator Walt Stryker, that they were going to do something about Bruin. I'm sure everyone's heard of Bruin from the Supreme Court and the changes that has had here in America. Well, they passed a couple bills that I doubt many of you care about. It's going to affect all of you. House Bill 824, that raised the renewal period and the amount of money you have to pay to renew up to $75. No one really is going to care about that. Why they chose to do it, I have no idea. Regarding Senate Bill 1, that's the big one. The Gun Safety Act of 2023, it does a lot, and they all go into effect on October 1st. This is not been thoroughly tested by the courts yet. Many of you are going to have wonderful hypothetical questions for you. I hate to say it, I don't know yet, because we're going to have to see how this shakes out. And as we go over a lot of the points of this law, I can't tell you why they did it. It makes no sense to me, but that doesn't change anything. And you all are the ones who are going to put yourselves potentially at jeopardy by failing to follow it. The biggest thing that comes from this is after October 1st, you cannot carry in an area for children and vulnerable individuals a government or public infrastructure area or a special purpose area. They all sound innocuous enough, but when we look at what each one of these are, it really is mind-blowing. And if you are caught violating this, it's up to a year in jail and a $1,000 fine. Area for children and vulnerable individuals. It's quite a list. Um, and these are all new additions. Prior to this lovely safety act, you obviously could not carry a firearm at a public school. Well, they've decided to add all preschools, pre-kindergarten facilities, or the grounds of those facilities. These are all going to be, most likely, private institutions. The daycare facility that's down the street from you that is not run by your local board of education. This would be the um, man or woman who has a private daycare facility in her house where she has up to six children that come there. It may not be well advertised. There may not even be a sign there. You cannot carry your firearm there in a concealed fashion. All private primary or secondary schools are the grounds of those schools. So whether it be Gilman, Boys Latin, any other private school in Maryland, this prior to the Firearm Safety Act of 2023 was not included. So if you go to an event at a private or secondary school of any kind, you cannot bring a firearm. A huge addition, health care facilities. I had to look this up and I was quite impressed at the what a list of a health care facility is. It's things you would think of like a hospital, but it's also a related institution as defined by 19301 of the Health General Article. That pretty much means anything that a hospital touches. If they have an off-site billing office, things of that nature, that would be included in a hospital, not just somewhere where you would go for care. An ambulatory surgical facility or center which in any entity or part thereof that operates primarily for the purpose of providing surgical services to patients, not requiring hospitalization, and seeks reimbursement from third-party payers as ambulatory surgical facility or center. That's going to be all of your patient firsts. That's going to be all of your minute clinics. Anything that's even in that genre. A facility that is organized primarily to help in the rehabilitation of disabled individuals. Be careful with that one. That is going to potentially be, obviously, um, something that is clearly marked as a rehab facility in terms of physical rehabilitation. But be careful. That could also potentially include anywhere that assists individuals with special needs in occupational and vocational training if they have appropriate licensure a home health agency, a hospice, 
a facility that provides radiological or other diagnostic imagery services, a medical laboratory. So once again, when you go to LabCorp to get your blood drawn, you cannot carry a firearm there after October 1st. And the biggest, an alcohol abuse and drug abuse treatment program as defined by 8403 of the Health General article. So if you were to visit someone who was in any kind of inpatient rehab or if you were to attend an outpatient class or organization somewhere, that would probably be covered under this. A government or public infrastructure area. That is going to be another huge and expansive list of places. A building or any part of a building owned or leased by a unit of state or local government. And you have to remember how large the local governments are. The Baltimore County Parks Office, for example, would clearly be covered by this. The Baltimore City Forestry Office off of Cold Spring Lane. Things that you would not necessarily think of at first blush. A building of a private or public institution of higher education. That would obviously be your Taos Universities, your Salisbury Universities, your Morgan States. It's also gonna include any institution that caters to post high school graduates. Your North American Trade School, your Community College of Baltimore County, all of them, you can no longer carry firearms there. This is gonna be difficult for some, the notice may not be great, a location that is used as a polling place. So on election day, when you go to vote to your polling place, best not have your firearm with you. Uh, I did not think this was a huge problem, but an electric plant, an electric storage facility, a gas plant, or a nuclear power plant, they are now off limits. So any of you who want to go down to Calvert Cliffs and things of that nature, do not bring your gun. The one thing government or public infrastructure areas under this section, they're required to display a clear and conspicuous sign at the main entrance. And notice it only says the main entrance. So if you go in a side entrance and you never see the sign, that's more of your problem than theirs. And that sign has to say the building is leased or owned by the state or local government and that it is not permissible to wear or carry a firearm in there. So Maryland is moving towards that model where if there is a sign up that says you cannot carry a firearm in there and it is a state or local government building, it is now a crime to carry the firearm in there in addition to any other crimes they charge you with. The most innocuous is the special purpose area. At first blush, it sounds almost Soviet, you know, a special purpose area, what in the world is that? That is a very expansive list stadiums, museums, racetracks. And I read this three or four times again today just to make sure. I don't know if they mean horse racetracks or automobile racetracks or both. I don't know. So whoever wants to find out and try, by all means, I'd be more than happy. Uh, video lottery facilities. A facility at which players play video lottery terminals and table games and a casino. My reading of this if you go into your local gas station that has live Kino in it, I think that would be a covered entity where you cannot carry a firearm. The other biggest one in here, a location licensed, keyword licensed, to sell or dispense alcohol or cannabis for on-site consumption. That is going to be the vast majority of your liquor stores. They may not let you drink in the liquor store, but especially in Baltimore City and Baltimore County, they have licenses that probably would allow them to serve liquor for on-premises consumption. They just choose for a variety of reasons not to allow that. So if you had your firearm while you went in there, that would be a problem. That's also going to apply to the vast majority of restaurants. Doesn't say if you're drinking or not drinking. Doesn't even say if they're actively serving. I'm sure if we scoured the state of Maryland, we could find a restaurant that has a liquor license that doesn't even serve liquor. But if you carried your firearm in there, you would run afoul of this new law. Another key portion of this, and once again, not my idea, Westmore didn't call me and say, what do you think of this, Mr. Saller? Anthony Brown, the Attorney General, didn't say, is this constitutional? Dwellings. 
A person wearing, carrying, or transporting a firearm may not enter or trespass in the dwelling of another, so that means someone else's house, and a dwelling in this case means just the house. It's the building or part of a building that provides living or sleeping facilities for one or more individuals. So they could come potentially on your front lawn, but no one can enter the house unless the owner or the owner's agent has given express permission either to the person or to the public generally to wear, carry, or transport a firearm in the dwelling. Be very careful with this when you move forward. Your buddy Fred says, oh, sure, carry your gun whenever you want. Something unfortunate happens and the police respond there and Fred's not there to say, oh, he could carry his gun here. It's going to be a situation where I fear the police are going to arrest first and ask questions later. Uh, dwellings do not include the common elements of condominiums, common areas, or multi-family multi apartments. So you theoretically can still carry your firearm if you go to check your mailbox in your apartment building or condominium. And it does not include the adjacent land. This and the final catch-all is really going to be the most controversial and the most difficult for everyone in this room. As of October 1st, you may not wear and carry, enter or trespass on the property of another unless the owner or the owner's agent has posted a clear and conspicuous sign indicating that it is permissible to wear or carry, or the owner or the owner's agent has given the person express permission to wear or carry on the property. So everywhere else you will go, unless there is a sign up telling you that you can carry a firearm in there expressly, or the owner of Walmart or someone in an authorized capacity has told you you can enter there with your firearm, it is going to be forbidden. So let's, let's break it down again, because we've had a lot of people send messages and, and texts and contact us with questions, and I know you went over a lot of information there. So let me just go through a few areas that have been brought up to me, some of which we may have already talked on, but for, for, the, for the benefit of the group. So example, question was, how about a CVS or a Walgreens with no signs posted? Absolutely not. Okay. If it does not have a sign posted, you'd be running afoul of the new law. So if they had one of these posted at the entrance, at all entrances, then we would be good with that? Yes. Okay. Um, how about and, a... Go, I'm sorry. Andrew, let me ask you this. Uh, the sign is posted at the door to the CVS, but my reading of the statute, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it prohibits you from even turning into the parking lot because the parking lot is consistent... It's, it's, constitute private property, will they? Well, you know, under the statute, the, in this case, they've defined property as strictly the building. So you would be okay in the CVS parking lot. You just could not go into the CVS. So not the curtilage, but the, the, the building yeah. itself, except for these government areas yes, where yes. the signage is posted. Okay. Yes. All right. How about this? A restaurant where you can get a glass of wine with your dinner, and there is a sign saying that you can carry in there. It's a trap. Doesn't matter how many signs they want to put up, if it's a licensed liquor establishment that is distributing alcohol on site, you cannot carry in there. Yes. Right, because the law specifically prohibits it. Yep. But we'll, we'll, we'll have a question and answer. Just hold your questions just till the end, and I promise you, I promise you, you probably have more, and then we can, we'll get to them all. Um, banks. How about banks? If they, unless, Was that your question? No, okay. <laughs> They have an exception for banks if you are an armored car driver, if you are a security guard acting in the course of your dealings, or if there is a sign posted. So if there is no sign posted at the bank and I'm about to leave the state and want to go on a crime spree, I will be hanging out outside of the bank because that's going to be prime pickings because you know no one who's coming out should have a gun on them. Right. All right, how about this one? You go to somebody's home to pick up your child from a birthday party. You better not go inside the home without saying, may I bring my firearm inside. If you pick them up from the yard or the child comes out to you, you're fine. But if it comes to actually walking across the threshold of the house through the door, you would be in violation. 
So now if they had a sign posted on their front door or something like these these uh, vinyl stickers, which you'll find back there, by the way, um, but if they had that posted, you'd be good. Yes. Funny how that works. It is. All right. Uh, so uh, how about this? Walmart. Walmart. Current corporate policy, as of a couple days ago, was they will allow you to carry concealed in the store. If you are going to Walmart, I would double check that every time before I went. Because knowing all you lovely people's luck, that would be the day that you would have to shoot someone in the Walmart, and it turns out the policy was changed the week before. Unless you have a line up to the Walton family, and they are going to give you express permission, do so at your own peril if you're basing it just on a published corporate policy, because those can change at any time, and they have no duty to notify you that the policy has changed. So that's posted on their website? Yes. Okay. How about the homes of family and friends? Once again, can be your brother, can be your mother, can be your father. Unless they have expressly given you permission, and it doesn't, the statute doesn't say how this has to be done. It could be orally, it could be written, it could be an email, it could be a telegram. You could do so if they gave you express permission or if they had a sign posted. Otherwise, there is no exception for that. Okay, so we covered daycare centers, I believe. How about, uh, and I think you also talked about the ones inside of people's homes, correct? That's the same thing. The statute, once again, I did not author it does not distinguish. So if it is a daycare facility, even though it is out of someone's home, and even if they gave you express permission, you could not carry a firearm in there absent some other factors. Now, is someone going to report you? Are you ever going to get caught? That's a separate issue. But God forbid, if you do have to use your firearm, be prepared to deal with that issue after the fact. All right, so we talked about health care facilities. How about your personal doctor's office or a patient first? Same? Going back to, once again, all of these medical facilities, they can have all the signs they want. They're specifically exempted under the statute, and you cannot bring a firearm in there. We talked about apartment complexes and condo common areas as being okay in, yes. that, in this case. All right, how about, oh, here's a good one. How about churches and places of worship? conspicuously absent from the statute so the regular rules would apply if you got explicit permission from the pastor or the board or something of that nature or there was a sign posted you are free to exercise your rights okay so let me ask you this i'm sure the question on everybody's mind is so when can you carry just driving down the road it is and that is, now. that is by design. Uh, Andre will cover a lot of this, but I have in my hand here the letter from our Attorney General in Maryland, uh, Anthony Brown, and it details specifically Senate Bill 1, and it says, uh, Dear Governor Moore, it is our view is that Senate Bill 1 is legally sufficient and is not clearly unconstitutional. It then... Yeah, so that's the standard they have employed to determine if uh, they're going to move forward with enforcement, and they have decided that Senate Bill 1, as enacted, is not clearly unconstitutional. So until these things are litigated, uh, your rights are severely constrained. If you are a qualifying person prior to Bruin that was a business owner, that had a reason to carry a firearm, your permit was much nicer five years ago than it is in a couple days. The ability to carry it is going to be severely constrained where you can carry and how you can carry. Another huge change in Senate Bill 1 is moving forward. In Maryland, it was just a carry permit. I do not advise it tactically, but it was your right up until October 1st to open carry. You had individuals who were open carrying in supermarkets, wherever they wanted, and unless the supermarket told you to leave, you were free to do so. Starting October 1st, it is no longer lawful to open carry. You must be carrying in a concealed fashion, and you cannot be printing for prolonged periods of time. Does everyone know what printing is? I uh, see some yeses, some noes. That is where, when I look at you, I can see the imprint of the firearm. 
guys that are in much better shape than me that like to wear really tight clothes. And if you had a firearm under your shirt and I could tell, that would be printing. So after October 1st, you cannot be caught printing with the firearm. A momentary uh, printing is okay. A momentary unintended exposure is okay. If uh, you've got it tucked in securely and your shirt blows up in the wind and someone notices for a second, so be it. But if you decide to tuck your shirt in inside the firearm so the uh, butt of your pistol is hanging out, that would be a crime after October 1st. So, so what if you approach one of these prohibited places and you're a concealed carry holder and you have your firearm on you and you're going to have to transact business into one of these places? What, what should these folks do? You're going to have to lock it in a container in your car. That's not ideal. It's not my idea. That is what your lovely representatives in Annapolis have determined is the best idea in this case. And, and there are containers you can get that will, you can mount them to your frame or, or somehow affix them to your vehicle and they would lock. Uh, so it's certainly better, I think, than having something that's just loose in there. Absolutely. So. All right. So thank you, Andrew, for that. So Andre, where are we with the legal challenges in both inside and outside of Maryland? Uh, the potential outlook for the timelines of these challenges and so forth? Well, with regards to Senate Bill 1, we're basically on emergency watch. Andrew and I were having a conversation off stage like, are we going to get a decision from the district court at 1259 on Saturday? We still haven't gotten a decision. There have been two challenges to Senate Bill 1 that is currently move, moving forward, and the court has recently consolidated it into one matter. So there are going to be, it's going to be one case. The court's going to issue one decision on both cases. How is the court going to rule? Right now, the challengers are seeking to enjoin this, at this law from taking effect October 1. How is it going to play out? that my best bet is to look outside of the state of Maryland. And Dwayne and I have been having this conversation since it was first, the statute was first proposed, the legislation was first proposed. And the closest thing to it is the New York state law that was passed within days of Bruin handed down by the court. It has some similarities, but a lot of differences. I, I like to describe it that Maryland took the New York law and they went on steroids with it. So where the New York case is right now, it's initially the district court ruled that the law was constitutional and then it was a setback. It's now in the circuit court of appeals, the second circuit. The circuit court is a sec the highest, the court right below the Supreme Court. That court has allowed parts of the statute to stay in effect while the litigation plays out and that can take years. So there are folks in New York, and before I get to that, New York actually went back and amend, recently amended the statute in a budget bill to allow pastors uh, 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 to carry our churches and synagogues and mosques and so forth. If they're clearly part of the security detail of that uh, house of worship. So they, because that was an issue that, that the courts were kind of not looking favorably on as part of the litigation. So they, they amended the statute to exempt these individuals. So that case is being played out in court right now. How is the Second Circuit going to rule? I, don't, I can't say how. But looking around the country since Bruin has been handed down, it's been a mixed bag. There have been cases in... Minnesota, where the courts have said on the Bruin, these laws in the state has to be struck down. Then you look at cases, there are cases in California where on some issues, the court's like, okay, this can stand. Even the Second Circuit in a separate case has said they will allow the restriction on transit to stand because they found some law from the 18th, 19th century where it was prohibited for you to have firearms on a private railroad. I have some issue with that uh, from a private entity now versus a government entity trying to say restrict you from carrying. As we all know, 
it's less likely for an individual to violate your constitutional rights. There usually has to be a government action involved to violate your constitutional given right. So it's a bit, bit of a mixed bag with the cases around. And if I'm a betting man, it's likely that Maryland's case will play out the same way New York, the New York case is playing out. I really don't believe that a district court judge in Baltimore is, U.S. district court judge, is going to enjoin this statute. We might fare a bit better at the Fourth Circuit, but we'll have to wait and see. I'm not optimistic. I'm a more so optimistic when it gets to an appeal in the Fourth Circuit after the case has been settled on the merits in the district court, what that result may look like. Because even in looking at the New York case, it was when the Second Circuit allowed the statute to take effect, it was appeal, an emergency appeal was filed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court allowed the law to stand and basically in a one sentence was like, we're looking at it. Don't take forever to decide this case because you're placing an enormous constraint on someone's constitutional rights. So the courts, I think it was Justice Alito was the one that issued the order, is keeping an eye on it. So what kind of timeline? I know you said it could take years. I mean, is that, what, what's a realistic thought on that? Well, when the statute took effect, and they signed it, he signed it into a law in May. Uh, when, did, May? Uh, when, the, uh, when did the governor sign it in? It was, uh, well, it, I don't know when. He signed it in May. It takes effect right. in October. October yeah. Yeah. And immediately when it was signed, the same day, the, the suit was filed. And the judge has yet to rule on whether or not he's going to grant the injunction. So just taking that timeline out, it takes effect in six days. Right. Federal Judge Benita said, no, it's unconstitutional, we'll do a magazine ban to California. But if I know any federal judge, encourage him to jump in and serve. Roger. Okay. Yeah, so let's say that the case, the judge issue an order by the end, of, the end of the year. We probably can look the entire 2024 for a trial, late 24. A decision on the merits of that will be made, and then you file an, you file an appeal to the Fourth Circuit. I will not be realistically hoping to get a result from the Fourth Circuit before either late 25, early 26. Okay. All right, so I appreciate that, Andre. So, so now it's come to the point in time where we can, uh, you snuck one in on me, but we'll, uh, we'll do that's okay. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and open up for questions. So what I would like to ask everyone to do is if you have a question, for the, for the benefit of everyone, come up to the microphone so everybody can hear your question, and then we can respond to your question. And uh, we'll go ahead and take, take the first one now. Hello. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm sure everyone in here is a responsible gun owner in the whole thing. How many speak speak into the sorry? Mic. How many instances has it been responsible gun owners shooting people? Do the courts take that into consideration? Because I'm sure none of us is out here looking for trouble or doing crimes or anything like that. So you know what I'm saying? In Maryland, when they enacted this bill. They could not find a single instance of a appropriately licensed concealed carry permit holder using the firearm illegally to justify this. Yep. So there's, uh, there's your answer. I will add to that. My office did a freedom of information request for instance in which a, conceal, a, fire, a wear and carry permit was revoked because that person used a firearm in one of these enumerated crimes. Nothing. Yep. As, as I was saying, nuclear power plants, we're having a rash of problems. We need to outlaw the carrying at nuclear power plants. 
Yes, sir. Go ahead. Just wanted to ask. Uh, speak into the mic so we can hear you. Just wanted to ask about hotels. If you could speak to hotels, you talk about restaurants, liquor stores, hospitals, sure. schools. So the question was hotels. Hotels are not listed by themselves. Now this is where it's going to get tricky, and this is where there are problems with that. Does the hotel have a restaurant that serves alcohol? Um, I would say that this is going to be a separate situation, but how close are the rooms to the restaurant, if there even is a restaurant? If it is your standard Motel 6 that does not have a restaurant that serves alcohol, not covered at all. So then it comes, the next thing, is there a sign? Right. And I, and I would add to that, under existing law, there's a discussion on innkeepers having the ability to restrict things that they consider dangerous, such as firearms, explosives, and other things through signage. So that would be covered now. So if a hotel or motel, in addition to what uh, Andrew said, had a sign saying you can't, then I would think that would be restrictive. Yeah, or if they don't have the sign that says you can, right. you can't. Any, bi any business. Well, and it's not a trap. Right, well, and it's not a trap. <laughs> if they have the sign that says you can, and they have a restaurant that serves alcohol, that's where things are going to get interesting. Okay. One, one, one more quick sure, addition. Sure. Um, on the sign, could you put a sign on a residence and, and confirm on a case-by-case -case basis whether a visitor has, is carrying and then rescind it if you don't want to give it to them. So, so your question is, is, if you put a sign such as one of these small ones here that right. you would put on your storm door or something like that, and uh, then someone came on that you didn't prefer to have a firearm there, could you rescind it? In that instance, you would ask the person to leave and the trespassing law, I would think, would take effect. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next. Yes, sir. Couple of their, uh, short sure, questions. sure. Just speak into the mic as best you can. You got to get a little bit close to it. Okay. On that, uh, those. Uh, Thank you, sir. Private daycares. You said they don't have to post a sign, so there's no willing and knowingly violation rider on that thing. Also, are there distances on those places that you mentioned, or is it the physical places? Oh, okay. Let's let's parse this one at a time okay. here. Daycare facilities. No carry. Period. Put all the signs up you want. No carry. So those, all those places, it's the physical places, not it's, that 100-foot buffer. No, thousand that foot was buffer. eliminated. That was of really dubious constitutionality. In the original bill, they wanted to do that. In between the House and the Senate, the 100-foot rule, some of you may have heard of, that's gone. Okay, so they need to have a report. Are the police going to be actively looking for this, or does it have to be a report? Do you know? Are there sheriffs that we refuse to? Well, I, I, I would think a complaint would have to be made by someone, and then the law enforcement would have to respond, and then they would have to determine if you were armed and, and so forth. But I, do, if the question is, do we think that, that law enforcement sheriffs or police officers are going to be sitting in front of daycare centers, my answer is probably not. Okay, my last one. Yep. What if I buy 100 fake signs and post that sign? It's got to be your day. house. <laughs> you don't get to put them on all the, all the – everybody buy those signs and put them on all the people in Annapolis's house. Yeah. All right, well, at night, all right? No, don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't, say, don't tell anybody I told you to do that. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, my you. question has to do with schools. How far away from a school property do you have to be to carry legally? One inch. Okay. So if you're across the street from a school and you're carrying, that would be legal? And, and let me not just... The, concealed? Concealed. Yes. That, that, that went away. Okay. So as it turns out, I bought a house long before I got involved in firearms right across from a public school. So if I'm carrying otherwise legally and I'm driving in the street or walking on the other side of the, the school to whatever my business is, you're telling me that should be okay. You, you keep a adding caveats to it as you uh, keep going here. But... <laughs> No, you're, you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. Thank you. You're welcome. If I go to my rental properties to pick up rent and I have to go into the house or I have to go into the house to do maintenance because I am the owner, am mm -hmm. I covered? This would be a rental house you own yes. specifically. Yes. And you are going in and you have a tenant that lives there is what you're telling us. Yes. Okay. And you go to there to collect rent. Um, you would, going back to here with dwellings, I believe you would be okay. 
when it says a person wearing, carrying, or transporting a firearm may not enter or trespass in the dwelling of another unless the owner, that would be you, has given express permission. Did you give yourself express permission? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you could even write something potentially into your lease agreement or something saying something to that effect if you wanted additional stuff in writing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. As a licensed real estate agent, does this mean I can no longer show a vacant, unoccupied property and carry? Do you own the property? I know the answer already. Yes, that's exactly what it means, and your safety be damned. We can't have these guns running around and committing all these crimes. So uh, if I want to do an open house, I have to get express permission from the homeowner. Not my idea, but absolutely. Okay. Uh, I have permission to carry in my church. However, our church has a building that is separate but still physically attached daycare five days a week. It does not operate during church hours. Sticky. <laughs> I didn't draft this law. If I drafted this law, I would have never written it. But if I did write it, I would at least write it to make sense. I cannot give you a good answer right now with that. I wish I could. I'm sorry. The people that wrote this law wrote it with a special intention in their hearts, and that was to destroy the Second Amendment. Sure, they put the exceptions in here. If you're an armored car driver, if you're a police officer, corrections officer, law enforcement officer, but for the average citizen, their intention was to strip you of your Second Amendment rights. Thank you. Can I just add something here? I'm guessing we're all in this room because we we're friends to the Second Amendment. And this law is going to take effect. It's going to have real world consequences. It's time we start contacting our state senators and our delegate and let them know. I don't think when this law was being drafted, I don't know how many folks like yourselves these folks heard from. So let them know the real life consequences that this law will have. It's no longer a theoretical exercise. It's going to take effect and it's going to have severe consequences in the real world. Some of the questions you're asking is the type of questions Andrew loves to litigate because that's the gray area. The statute is not, some of the language is not clear. It's ambiguous at best. So you get on the phones, call their offices. If you have friends that are in a similar situation, have them call their offices. These, it's an election year coming up. These folks want to hear, let them know the consequences that folks are going to have with these laws. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. In regards to a private club, um, going to a private club, we have uh, affairs. We had to buy a one-day liquor license for that affair. So are you telling us that that one day we can't carry on our club property? I am. Okay. <laughs> Not my idea. Well, what the law is. You're yeah. just you're <laughs> telling me what the law says. I'm telling you to do whatever you want. Right. Yeah, After you get caught, call me and I'll help you. Yeah. But Get your card. <laughs> yes, sir. Come on. I did call a lot of the delegates. MSI sent out a list of people several days while the deliberations were going on, they could have cared less. They could have absolutely cared less and, and acknowledged they were receiving calls all day against, and they could have cared less. My question, and I don't know if this changed in the law, say like national parks, the CNO Canal, which I think is under the jurisdiction of national parks, but it's in Maryland. Or is it legal to carry, assuming you've, you're, you have your permit and everything else? So you're asking me, about a federal park that happens to be within the state of Maryland. Yes. Is that a fair statement? Yes. That is not covered by Senate Bill 1. That can only affect Maryland or Maryland, you know, political subdivision properties. So that would not be covered by this. Whatever the latest park rules are, I remember President Trump was allowing carry. I know Biden was feeling differently about that. So I can't answer that question because it's outside of Senate Bill 1. Okay, right. and, and I would add, too, that, uh, and you're absolutely right, uh, myself, Andrew, James over there, we were uh, in Annapolis when, uh, in 2013 when the horrible bill uh, took place then. 
and uh, there was I don't know we didn't even make it into the no. make it into the building to give testimony. Like I went in and I had this this document that I wrote, and I went in and there was piles and stacks of stuff in opposition to the law, and there was maybe two or three or ten people that showed up in support and a little tiny pile. So I get it, I get the frustration, but but yeah, we just got to keep up the good fight. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Someone put that comment. Yeah, really somebody high. Help, help yeah. her out with that. Thank you. So we can all, all right. hear. I'm in my car huh? with my gun. A little closer. And I'm driving on a state highway. Okay. Am I okay or no? You have a handgun permit? Yes. And you're driving in your car on a state highway? On a state highway. Yeah, I don't see any problem with that at all. You're fine. Yep, okay. you're good. Um, does Senate Bill 1 change anything about the mag limits? And can you kind of clarify the magazine limits? There's something in Maryland about the 10. It has, uh, so that, that goes back to 2013. Senate Bill 1 here has nothing to do with magazine limits. In 2013, the legislature, in their infinite wisdom, decided to criminalize the manufacture or sale of magazines that contain more than 10 rounds. We're calling them assault magazines now yeah. uh, in the state of Maryland. But isn't there some language that you can? So, so to, to clarify, you can. You can buy the magazines out. What? Go ahead, Andre. Go ahead. The bill prohibits the sale of the magazine, not the possession. Right. So if you purchase a magazine that has more than a 10-round capacity outside of the state of Maryland, right. it's legal for you to have it in the state of Maryland. It's not illegal okay. to possess it, just okay. illegal to purchase it in the state. Right. And don't sell it. Don't and don't sell it. it. Right. Or <laughs> go over the state line and do that. Don't yeah. do it in Maryland. Right. But it says receive. It says may not manufacture, sell, offer for right. sale, purchase, receive. In Maryland, yeah. though. In, in Maryland. 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 Yeah, no, so you're good if you buy it out of Maryland. So don't go on cheaper than dirt, buy a hundred pack of them for $8 a piece and right. get them shipped you can't to your have house them in shipped Maryland. In. Right. But yeah, so this, you this, buy in Pennsylvania. And, and, and by the way, the state police has already ruled on this. So it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's it, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Yep. All right. I think that's everything. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, uh, We'll get a better mic stand next time. You're the keeper of the mic. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> just, just remember to speak into it so we can hear you. So with all the changes that's, that's coming up with the regulations for gun concealed carry, have there been any changes or concessions about non-lethal forms of protection? Knives, pepper spray, tasers, a metal baton or an aluminum baseball bat not in senate they, Bill they were too busy to deal with yeah. that this year that's next year's project <laughs> probably probably so no but not not in this batch no yes sir Let's do with schools and uh, upper education can't, can't hear you i'm sorry just uh, speak into yeah. the mic i apologize sir thank you is that better that yes. is much better yes um driving past the school driving past now under senate bill one driving past a private school driving past you're good to go. If you turn and drive onto the athletic field, if you drive into the parking lot, if you get out of your car and walk up into the school, none of those are allowed. Uh, if you have um, a weapon on you and you put it in a lockbox, are you legal then? No. Okay. All right. Meaning when you drive onto the school property. Yeah. So you're, you're driving, talking about... You're driving you're, to, into the, say, the parking lot. No, no. yeah. So what, what the what the best course of action would be to be parked somewhere off the school grounds, secure that weapon, go transact whatever business you need to, and then come back out. Yeah. Unless you, you cannot so. have the firearm on the parking lot of the school. Okay. Okay. Any okay. school property, period. Yes, sir. All right, I might have missed the one question I had while I was in the bathroom, but so I'm a mechanic. How does this affect me while I'm at work? Like if I'm if I'm working on a car, like I, because I carry sometimes. I'm at the my business by myself at like not late at night. Um, how would that affect me? Let me just answer your question with a yeah. question. You yeah. own the business? No, I don't. You got problems. Who owns it? My boss. How does your boss feel about the Second Amendment? He supports it. If he gives you express permission to carry at the business, and you work for him. And there is a sign, you're good to go. Okay. Andrew. With him, there's a lot of questions here that aren't exactly 
what is your exact role at the mechanic shop? Yeah. What does he want you? Does he want you specifically there? There is an exception with a firearm if you're there to protect the property or business, not as a licensed security guard. This is a complex question, not a 10 second thing. Let so, me add to that question yeah. for you, Andrew. Your boss, does he own the actual premises where the business is so located? Not, not my particular building. Not my building, but I, I do know that the owner who owns the actual building supports the Second Amendment. Right. Now it gets even stickier. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, hence why so, I, was, I was happy to ask, was there a sign or not? Is your boss the lessee? Yes. Okay. So if he's the lessee, he can potentially give you explicit permission to have the firearm. There. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Come on up and just make sure you're, you're speaking into the microphone. Uh, yes. That's uh, perfect. Quick, Thank you, sir. Two quick questions. One is related to church again, because uh, a lot of churches have daycare, but it's only on church services or church Sunday. So in that case, you're not allowed. Is that what you're saying? Well, let me ask a question with a question. Is it a licensed daycare facility through the state of Maryland, or is it just a couple of other good, kind parishioners looking out for children so that their parents can attend services uninterrupted? I believe some are licensed and some may not be. If it's, okay, great. <laughs> are you a lawyer, sir? <laughs> no, sir. And I don't play one, and I didn't yeah. stay in the Holiday Inn. Oh. <laughs> I would be very wary. Because... At the same time, we always need a test case. But if there is a state-licensed daycare facility in the same building uh, that you are attending church in, the earlier question, it was kind of a separate building, which I would like that situation more than if this was our church and where the restroom is, we've also got a daycare. I do not think this law was well-crafted, and that is that. Okay, the second question is in relation to the injunction. So if there's no injunction this week, the law goes into effect, is that correct? At midnight on October 1st, if with a bar and an injunction, yes, now, the law can, takes effect. Can an injunction be offered after that date? If the court does, decides to enjoin it after, yes. If it takes effect and it gets enjoined at a later day and time, yes, it's then enjoined. It could be enjoined in whole or in part. Okay, thank or you. Or not at all. Yes, sir. Slight tangent. I have freedom of speech. I have freedom of religion. However, my Second Amendment right depends on which state I go to. Is there anyone at all working on this? <laughs> all right, so say the last part again. I have freedom of speech. Right. I have freedom of religion. As far as my Second Amendment rights are concerned, my right to carry and defend myself depends on what state I go to. True. Yeah. Is there anyone working on this at all? That's a question for you, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say the short answer to that question, is there anyone working on a, like, is there one broad case that is tackling that nationwide? Why is this constitutional right different than the other? It's a good question. I just watched the video on, that came across USCCA on YouTube. I forget which state it was from, but it was in the Northeast. Man had a concealed carry license, drove over the state line, got pulled over, got arrested. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And they fought it, and that's exactly what his defense was. We're hoping the state fights it so it can go to the Supreme Court to make it a national. But if you, obviously, a lot of you have seen that video. Anything? The short answer to your question is that I agree with you. The, the right to keep and bear arms and the right to carry is one of those rights that is not transferable state to state. Like, we likely have a driver's license. My Maryland driver's license, I can cross the state line into Virginia. I can go to California. It's accepted. Your Maryland permit to carry is, n is not likely to be accepted in California. And it's the full faith and credit issue. It's not an issue that the court has decided 
the, to my knowledge, the Supreme Court has not decided this issue. Whether or not the state of California or any other state has to recognize a permit that was issued in another state. And personally, it's an issue I have to deal with, and I was just explaining to Duane, I was recently in South Carolina this summer, and prior to leaving, I got online and checked what the laws were in Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina to carry, because I did not want to run afoul of those state laws. Especially, sir, the question is, is anyone working on national reciprocity? As I said, no, there's not one single litigation that is moving through the courts, but they are, go ahead. So um, the USCCA has actually came out with a company called the Super PAC, completely separate entity to what the USCCA itself actually is. So the same way you have like FPC, you have the NRA who are fighting for your gun rights throughout the entire time. USCCA has now created a super PAC where all of the donations and stuff that go towards that actually work for us to be able to fight for national reciprocity. So if you guys are donating towards that organization, that is the sole purpose of what that organization is focused on. It's the USCCA super PAC, and they are focused on precisely that piece because every other major organization kind of neglected it. FPC and NRA, not that they neglected it, they just focused on things that they thought were maybe more attainable. Whereas with what our mission is and what our mission is focused on, it more directly aligns to where our focus is. And that's, you know, that is the organization that would be working on that in particular. Okay, very good. Uh, yes, sir. One of the previous gentlemen actually had uh, asked the question I was going to ask, but I wanted to put a shameless plug, if I will, for those who are not members of Maryland Shall Issue. I would encourage you to join Maryland Shall Issue. As frustrating as it is, your voice is heard. It, were it not for your voices, this SB1 would have been worse than it is right now. So it, it, the, the, the frustration is designed to get you not to act. And so I, I spent 25 years on the federal level in politics, and I can tell you that your voice, it's not a question of whether they care or not, it's a question of what they vote. And they understand that they are an election away from being a member. And they will not be reminded, um, they will not be reminded of that fact unless your voice is heard. So don't let your, your, your discouragement stop you from being active in voting. It is your vote is a constitutional right. People have, there are people here who shed blood for the right for you to vote. Take advantage of that and have your voice heard. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you. So what if the cops were pulling you over in front of the school and want you to pull onto the property to get a ticket? <laughs> well, I'll be and, waiting your call. Oh, there you go. There's My paralegal answer. Chelsea's back there. She's like 7-Eleven. She never closes. And uh, give us a call when it happens. And I got a tra I drive a tractor trailer. Do I got to get one of them stickers put in my window? Couldn't hurt. You know. my boss it's always, always a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Evening. Thank you guys for doing this. Thank um, you. A couple things. Our, my church has a small security detail. Some of us carry. Some of us don't. Um, we don't, our, our facility is kind of broken up in that we have a worship facility, a separate building that is small children, infants and toddlers, and then another building that is um, kind of our Sunday school program. And we call it Sunday school. Does that make it a school? What Should we it, change the name of it? What if, and I know I'm answering a question with a question, I get it. What, if any, licensure does it possess from the state of Maryland? Just 501c3. Well, not right, but that's yeah. a tax status. Yeah. You, you have nothing to do with the Department of Education. You, right. uh, you're not qualified to be teaching. I mean that in the nicest way uh, right. in terms of you have no curriculum that is approved by the Department of Education. I, I'm not sure that changing the name would necessarily be necessary. Right. Part B, we offer... AA and Narcotics Anonymous, is that considered health care? Are you licensed through the Maryland Department? It formerly was of health and mental hygiene, but now Department of Health. Yeah. So you're just allowing AA or NA meetings on the grounds. Is that correct. a fair statement? That's correct. Um, 
I would have to look and see what is an alcohol abuse and drug abuse treatment program as defined by 8403 of the health general article before I could answer that. Okay. So short term, because I'm, I'm a leader give, at the church, give, give me should a call. I recommend... Give, give my card, give me a call tomorrow and I'll let you know. Okay. And then part, and the next one is what actually constitutes being armed. So if I have my weapon on me, nothing in the chamber, no magazine in the clip, is, but I have magazine. Let me, let me just short circuit you uh, in the interest of time. It's the firearm that is the crime in Maryland. If you had no ammunition anywhere near you at all, the firearm is what does. A gloriously expensive hammer is illegal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, do either one of you gentlemen know, uh, from my understanding, Judge Russell has this case in front of him? Federal it's a, Judge it's Russell. a question, do we know Judge Russell? Yeah, do you know him? And I know you have Judge a, Russell. Do you have an opinion on how he may rule? None that I'm willing to share. <laughs> okay. All right. If, you, if one of us was caught in the grocery store carrying and we were arrested. And no sign. And no sign. So we're definitely illegal. Do you honestly think that your law firm could do anything with that charge? In, when Bal it's in clear. Baltimore City, right now, Ivan Bates, his office policy, doesn't matter the circumstances, doesn't matter anything. They're asking for a year of active incarceration for every handgun possession case. Gotcha. And You tell me how much a year of your life is worth. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Several of us travel with firearms through BWI Airport. Is this particular, and of course they require a lock case and you carry it in from the parking lot and all of this. Does this law impact our ability to transport firearms on, in lock cases uh, through the uh, airlines at BWI? This law specifically does not affect that so long as you would still be having to comply with the FAA. And once again, you're not talking about carrying concealed through the airport. You're talking about shipping Tran your gun. Transporting. Right. This law has no effect on that whatsoever. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Rich, come on up. So my question is really around some of those circumstances that you're talking about. Got to go into the mic, I'm Rich. Um, say I'm stopping home get gas. I'm not going into the Royal Farm, but I'm getting gas. I'm carrying. Am I legal? You I'm didn't legal. enter the building. You're okay. Just okay. don't change your mind and go in to buy a lottery bank. ticket. Same with the bank. If I use a teller machine and don't go in the bank. You're okay. All right. If I, if I do come across a circumstance where I do need to, like I'm going to go into the Royal Farm now, and I have a lockbox, do I have to remove the magazine from the weapon and lock it? Now, there's is no it, indication of that in the law. Not oh. covered by the law. I didn't know if that now becomes a transportation of a firearm scenario. No, because you're you have a you're a permit holder. You're allowed yeah. to be where you're at with the weapon. Simply okay. putting it while it's in the holster in the lockbox. I don't see that being a problem. So long as you're not already on a prohibited area. Gotcha. Thank Unless you. you guys disagree. I agree. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, let's say I'm going up to Baltimore City, and I'm just going to walk around up there. Can I take the light rail and carry my firearm? <laughs> or, so, or, or ride the transit bus up there? Well, <laughs> uh, to take the light rail, you're going to have to go on government property, I imagine, correct? I would think that's owned by the state, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you, you see where the problems begin. Yeah. You probably need it on there, though, but uh, <laughs> you can't have it. That's the exact reason yeah. I asked. I don't normally take it, but that's why yeah. I'm talking. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, how does, this, how does the uh, Senate bill apply to the Leosa gun permits? So, Leosa, you want to hit this one or do you want me to? Um, I will. It does not affect. Leosa is still enumerated as an exception in there if you are qualified under LEOSA, carrying your credentials is required by LEOSA, and maintaining in good standing with that. I'll defer to Dwayne. So, so we're talking active or retired here? Retired. Okay, so I had a meeting with uh, our FOP president last week. Uh, prior to that, we had some discussion with the law firm that represents the FOP. 
uh, and it is my it is our understanding it's the FOP's understanding uh, and I'm not speaking for them I'm just saying what they told to me so secondhand uh, that it did not cover retirees and in fact that was supposed to be covered when the law was written and it was not um, and so they are working uh, with Annapolis to try and get this matter resolved whether it be through easier methods or law type uh, suit type of methods um, but it is my understanding from the discussion that I had and I, I defer to these two distinguished gentlemen but the, the information I have from Thursday of last week was that retirees are not covered and you are treated the same as any concealed carry holder in Maryland. Wonderful. Agreed. <laughs> um, and just a, a little thing, a little side note for everybody. You're saying notified of politicians and everything. Maryland's a blue state. In order to get any kind of conservative law passed, you need 14 Democrats to vote conservative. Guess what? Never going to happen in our lifetime. It's just not going to happen. Or 14 now. I didn't yeah. hear that. Thank <laughs> you, sir. They, they agree. Won't do it. No, I we uh, I agree. I agree. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, I find a very interesting coming from Europe. Uh, in two thousand eight, I immigrated to the United States. Having a two, two foot long piece of wood in the car would be considered already a weapon, and you could be incarcerated uh, at the best. Um, coming to the United States, I joined the NRA. Got a bunch of couple of guns and I thought I was enjoying it. But the more I hear about it, the more I question the the, the need for concealed carry, seeing that you basically can carry it nowhere, anywhere. So um, is it worth the effort? Is it worth the strain and the stress if everything is so tight in, in this state, you know? Unfortunately, I ended up in this state. But it is what it is. And, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's worth what you think it's worth. Um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we'll see what comes out in the wash, they say, uh, at the end of all these lawsuits and everything else. Um, it doesn't prohibit you from carrying everywhere. It just really, really narrows it down in a tremendous way. Um, for me, you know, I'd rather have the ability than not have it. But again, it really comes down to your personal preference. I'm cautiously optimistic about, uh, at the end of the day, us winning. But I guess we'll see. Yeah, I was enjoying the, the uh, Supreme Court ruling on Brun. I think finally we have some air and we got some breathing sprays. And then you leave it to the, uh, the Maryland to screw it up. And so, yeah, we need to be more politically active. You know, and that's, uh, well, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, in addition to belonging to USCCA, I'd like to encourage all the women to join the Armed Women of America. We have two chapters so far here in Maryland. We train monthly, uh, and it, that includes education in addition to being on the range. Um, Andrew, my questions are, are more, are, I'm asking you, I guess, maybe to make a statement. Um, would you speak to the value of belonging to Maryland shall issue if there's an injunction and it only covers the people who belong to, who are a party, I guess, to the lawsuit? And number two, there's some confusion in our group um, about having the restriction on the back of your carry card removed after October 1st. Do you know anything about so, that? So those are null and void after... Yeah. Um, when they, uh, that was what, uh, July the 7th, I believe, yep. they, or then they very quickly amended it on the 8th where they said, and you can't have it anywhere else that they're prohibited. Yeah. Uh, so the restrictions, whether they're on there or not, they're, they're gone. Okay. So that's to that answer, but I'll allow Andrew to answer the first part, I guess. What you're asking me, as I understand it, is that if Maryland shall issue is successful in their lawsuit and they get an injunction from Judge Russell or any other esteemed member of the district court bench, will that only apply to Maryland shall issue? No, it would likely apply to all Maryland citizens. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so these will be the last two questions in the interest of time, and then we'll be sticking around afterwards to answer additional questions. Yes, sir. Hi, right, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, also ATMs. I understand about the ATMs that are outside of a bank, but what about those ATMs that are in the portion that are in the enclosed portion of a bank? Not where you're going into the bank itself, but where it's like, like for example, uh, Capital One. It's enclosed. You got to swipe your card to get in there, but 
how would that pertain to this? You're not going to like my answer. <laughs> but I got to ask. But I got to yeah. ask. I didn't write the law. Right. I don't like the law. You're in trouble. And, and even if, and even if uh, you're going there at night when the bank is closed and you have to get money, whatever, that still applies. Sir, you take your common sense elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got to ask. Got to ask. But thank you. It just, it just gives I'm sorry. Clarity. It just yeah. clarity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. A little confused. Um, when you're looking at this law, I'm looking at what they printed in the paper anyway. I mean, you went into a lot more detail. A little bit closer to the mic, sir, so we can hear you better. But in spe specifically, like Walmart and banks and gas stations, how does that come out of this law? I mean, how the way they, they're presenting it to the public? This goes back to the wide sweeping portion of it that is property of another. Property of another? Yes. Oh, in the statute, it says property of another. Property is the buildings, not land. May not wear and carry, enter or trespass on the property unless the owner or the owner's agent has posted a clear and conspicuous sign indicating that it is permissible. Once again, your clear and conspicuous sign. Um, or the owner or the owner's agent has given the person express permission to wear and carry on the property. So if it is not one of the enumer specifically enumerated, going back to the, uh, and this is where it's, once again, this law is designed to be confusing. Don't get them wrong. Unless it is an area for children and vulnerable individuals, a government or public infrastructure area, or a special purpose area, then everywhere else in Maryland is covered. Is there a sign? Yes, you can carry. If there is not a sign, did the owner or the owner's agent give you explicit permission you can carry? If not, you cannot. Is there, is there any way a person that, who doesn't come to this meeting would know any of this by looking at what they're telling you through the news outlets? No, and uh, you all are smart for being here. The ones who didn't come here, I need to retire someday, so. <laughs> Thank Let you. me add so, this. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. As of October 1st, when in doubt, just stow the weapon in your lockbox because I don't think anyone in this room will want to be the first the test case to question the legality of or the constitutionality of any section of this act. Yeah. So all right, until I, this is litigated out and a court has ruled on it, if you're in doubt, take those precautions and not carry. Sure. So, okay, so we're going to go ahead and um, get ready to conclude this portion, um, but we're still going to make sure we stick around to have some private discussions and everything else. But first, let me bring up Chris Pruitt again from USCCA. He's going to say a few words. Um, we may do this again, so I'll be talking to him about that um, for all the folks that couldn't make it, but on you, Chris. All right, so last couple things. Um, for those of you who are not members yet, we do have um, ammo cans that you guys can receive as long as you join at Platinum or Elite throughout the course of the night tonight as well. For those of you who are not members, for those of you who are members, I know a large portion of the people I speak to, especially inside of classrooms and stuff of that nature, they usually choose either the gold or platinum member level simply because they really don't know what they're joining for online. That's my honest opinion. Um, if you are somebody who has a gold or platinum membership level and you kind of are realizing that that training and understanding and deeper ability to understand and assess situations is probably at that point of where you are. Um, we do have the ability to help you guys jump up to that higher member level here tonight too. So you guys can come back, you know, have those conversations. If you guys have questions, stuff of that nature, we can ob obviously address them no matter what, but we also want to help people be able to get that higher level of training. Cause most people don't even think about it. And honestly, most people don't even know that we even have training. They just see insurance and right. I'm the insurance guy. You know why? Because I said the word insurance one time tonight, <laughs> right? <laughs> Seriously, how it goes. Sometimes we neglect and forget the training is the most important part. So if you guys are at that member level, you know, please come back. Let's have those conversations and help you guys out in that process as well. Yep. Well, why don't we uh, go ahead? Just step up there. So we don't 
assign any one particular attorney. Me and him have actually had a lot of conversations today because through the conversations that we've had, I realized that he needs to be on our list. <laughs> like, and I think everybody in this room can absolutely agree that he 100% should be on our list, right? I'm going to need that recording. <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> no pressure or anything. Um, that's number one. Number two is the one beautiful part about membership is that it doesn't really matter what attorney you choose. You do have the right to choose whatever attorney you want. So even if he isn't part of the list currently, if you get put into an incident tonight and you go back to that table, you grab his business card or Chelsea's business card, uh, <laughs> more importantly, you grab that business card, you get put into an incident tonight. It doesn't matter if he's not part of the list. This is the attorney that you guys want. This is the attorney you guys want representing you. All you have to do is call and request him in particular, and it's still included as part of that membership as well. So make sure that throughout the course of the night, they are there to help you at that back table. They do have his business card, stuff of that nature. I'm going to give a, high, a nice recommendation for everybody here tonight. I want you guys all to take your membership card. I want you to take his business card. I don't want you to put his business card directly behind your membership card, because if you're pulling out your membership card, you need his card next, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. All right, so as we bring the speaking portion of tonight's event to a close, I want to remind everyone that our guests, we will all be sticking around. All right, so please stick around with us, have some discussions with us. I do have a, a, a great offer for you. Um, if you sign up for the Urban Defense email list, you've subscribed to our YouTube channel, you like and comment on the video for tonight. So this video that we're taking tonight will be released on our YouTube channel so you can watch it again. You can share it with people that you think need to see this, all the people that couldn't make it. Important information. So if you, if you subscribe to our channel, the information is back there. If you like, comment um, and on this video, you'll have a chance to win a free spot in one of our upcoming classes, HQL, Wear and Carry, Renewal, your choice uh, with some stipulations that you'll see over there. Our next permit class, Saturday and Sunday, October 8th or 7th and 8th. Renewal class, uh, Sunday, October the 8th, and our next HQL class, Saturday, October the 8th. Also, we just released our force-on-force -force reality based training program where we're going to use real, we've already done it, we did it on Saturday, but we're going to be releasing uh, the next version of it uh, in December using real training equipment and uh, tactics that we use in the law in, in the police department uh see luke back there or jerry to uh or, or me and i'll give you more information on that and finally in that same vein we're very excited and jerry back there is very excited that we're going to be releasing our emergency trauma care class this class is designed to help help you to prepare with uh, for gunshot wounds and traumatic injuries okay so very important uh, crucial skill that you need in this type of uh, setting um, it'll contain patient assessment tourniquets wound packing stuff like that maximum of 10 students and that one's set for saturday november 4th right here in this building from eight to one taught by our former tactical medic amongst many other things jerry hines in the back in the urban defense shirt see him he'll be happy to explain it to you and he will talk to you literally for an hour about this stuff if you want so for maryland gun owners urban defense the uscca our guests our sponsors vendors and staff please go say see the vendors say hi to them and thank them for being here um i want to thank you all for attending i want you to please use good judgment stay safe out there and good night to all of you thank you